Hello, everyone. I'm Cynthia Littleton, business editor of Variety. Thank you so much for joining us today for Variety's streaming room, The Tipping Point for Connected TV Storytelling and Advertising. We have an interesting panel today of ad tech expert meets ad sales expert. So we should have an, a good, lively conversation about the, the state of the art in television advertising right now, which is like everything else in television, changing at a rapid clip and we have two perfect people to talk and, and let, let us know where the state of this art is moving. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists, starting with Krishan Batia, Executive Vice President of Business Operations and Strategy and Ad Sales for NBC Universal, and Tim Sims, Chief Revenue Officer of ad tech firm, The Trade Desk. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, I think I believe we're all uh, we're all East Coast, although we know it's a global business now these days. Um, tell me, we really wanted to drill down in this panel of, on the impact of connected TVs, which have more than hit critical mass. The penetration rates are now significant enough to make them a real platform for marketers, for advertisers, and certainly for storytellers. Let's start by. I guess, Tim, I would just love your perspective. The Trade Desk has said that its mission is very simply to change the way advertising is bought and sold. Given the landscape that we're in and that we are seeing connected TVs and addressable advertising options grow by leaps and bounds in the last couple of years, what is this doing to the overall marketplace for teleadvertising? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think if, if you look at where the Trade Desk fits into the kind of overall ecosystem, we're here to help enable data-driven advertising for brands and marketers uh, and their agencies. And if you look at just the history or, or just kind of the, the arc of, of programmatic um, in the media landscape, it really is kind of centered on that idea, right, which is that I'm going to use data and apply data across a wide swath of inventory everywhere in the world. A lot of times, like uh, a part of my role is overseeing our partnerships with, with folks like NBCU uh, and Krishan. And so a lot of times I, I look at my role in, in that part of uh, the world as how do we help our clients, you know, bring access to every impression on every screen everywhere in the world. And what that really is about is about the application of data um, so that we can make smarter decisions around media investment and media allocation. So if that's the core principle behind programmatic, then what's happening in today's landscape is that television is starting to become part of that conversation. And so what's been incredible to see over the last you know, couple of years is television start to move in that direction. And largely that's being driven by the consumers who are, who are moving their consumption habits into connected television platforms, into AVOD services, all so that they can watch incredible content from folks like NBCU on different types of devices and in different settings and on different delivery mechanisms. And what that means for advertisers is that they can now finally take all that data that they've been utilizing in the digital ecosystem and point it at the television screen. And that's a huge advancement and a huge opportunity moving forward for both marketers and brands, as well as content owners like NBCU. Mm -hmm. Krishan, tell me from your side of the desk uh, on this equation, what has the ability to bring a more focused and strategic effort to how NBC Universal across all of your platforms, how you slice and dice what had been very sort of very broadly defined demographics based on age and gender. And I would imagine it's a whole new world now and, and that in getting there is probably a technical challenge just even within your existing infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo what Tim said, um, you know, from the consumer perspective uh, with everything. And uh, we've seen a really pivotal, pivotal moment occur over the last 12 to 18 months in terms of consumers shifting to connected TV streaming platforms. Um, our digital video consumption, uh, just to give some uh, statistics over the last year is up by more than 55%. Within that, CTV is actually up by more than double. So I do think that we're at a sort of tipping point in terms of the consumer voting with their time on digital platforms where the convenience and the depth of content from companies like ourselves you know, is just a very compelling offering. And so then you marry that with the ability on those platforms by default to 
enable the scale of television and the quality of television with the precision of digital, uh, which, as you said, yeah, encompasses everything from a data enablement and targeting perspective. And if you think about uh, offerings like Peacock, uh, which has been in the market now for the past few months, um, those are direct to consumer businesses where programmers like NBC Universal now have a direct relationship with customers. Uh, we register them and we're able to uh, tailor our services, but also our advertising messages from our clients to them. That's one. Two is we're engaging with partners, distribution partners in particular, around uh, how we create data partnerships that are at the intersection of our content offerings and their distribution platforms. And then thirdly, you know, our partnership with Trade Desk, for example, is how do we enable programmatic sales and programmatic targeting for our brand marketers and increasingly long tail advertisers as well in a data enabled fashion. So you really ultimately have um, the best of both worlds. Again, the scale and quality of television with the precision and targeting of digital. It's interesting because, you know, for decades, I, you know, uh, just, just the fact that an NBC Universal would want to work with an ad tech firm like a trade desk, you know, for decades, advertising inventory was like, stay away. I don't want anybody else touching. This is my inventory. Every network sales executive was incredibly, you know, sort of turf conscious. And it's just a sign of the world that we're in that, that, that an NBC Universal, a company like that, you know, very long and for, you know, practically a century engaged in the business of selling advertising is looking for new pathways to, to make, you know, to make sense of a, what has definitely become much more of a two-way street. I wanted to ask, it's my understanding that connected TVs really are the sweet spot because you get the most amount of data, even of you get the most amount of data from what a person or family is watching on that TV set, even more so than you could get from a cable set top box, which of course that data I know was not widely shared with content owners. But am I right in thinking that there is just a gusher of information that comes through a connected TV set? Well, for us, uh, I think uh, not sure that that's necessarily the case because we look at it more in terms of um, the totality of the consumers and households that we reach. Um, our one platform approach that we launched at the beginning of this year and that we've been in March actually encompasses both our traditional uh, core television business as well as our digital and CTV business. As you referenced, Cynthia, on the core TV side, uh, we do utilize data that's collected from set-top boxes um, and other devices to create an audience graph that we can then use either first-party or third-party data segments to append to and optimize um, linear campaigns or addressable campaigns within the traditional cable footprint. And on CTV um, and OTT platforms, uh, I would say it's probably easier, like the scale of access to data is easier just because by definition, all those platforms are digitally enabled. Um, the ads are digitally uh, served in our case through Freewheel. And so the data stream and the data density is higher. Um, but our goal really is to have an audience graph that uh, quite frankly encompasses the entire audiences that you reach and also unduplicates those households or consumers that are watching on multiple platforms. One of the things that we launched in the front marketplace this year was a cross-platform optimization tool that actually allows clients to build plans that run on linear platforms as well as on digital platforms, but are optimized for reach and frequency. And we're in the middle of building hundreds of plans along those lines right now. That's really been a massive ask by marketers and, uh, and advertisers uh, for the obvious reason. You want to reach the right amount of people you know, with the right frequency. And historically, that's been a very hard thing to solve. And if you put it through the lens of our content consumption, take any of our shows, take This Is Us or, or Saturday Night Live, for example, the consumption is so split between these different platforms that, that in order for you as a marketer to reach the full audience potential, you really have to be in all places um, with those consumers. This Is Us, for example, is a show that's about 42% digital now and 58% linear. Um, SNL is kind of the, the, the reverse of that, about 60% digital and 40% linear. So if you as a marketer want to lean into either of those shows and you want the full reach of the audiences that are engaging with those shows, 
then our recommendation as a programmer is let's engage with you on a cross-platform basis. We'll build you a plan that reaches the audiences that are watching it on either live, you know, or in some cases on DVR or VOD, as well as the audiences that are engaging on CTV platforms or even short form platforms like YouTube. Uh, and the sum total of that ultimately represents, you know, the most uh, effective campaign for you. Yeah, I think, I think this is an important place to just click in to, just for one second too, because everything Prashan said is so important to just to how the marketplace is going to evolve over, over the next couple of years, which is that if you look at this through the lens of a, of a marketer uh, or a brand, you're now entering into this digital world where you're spending an enormous amount of time and effort and, and likely money understanding your customer as a brand and a marketer. And so right. you're, you're probably hiring data scientists, you're working with data management platforms and all this other stuff to understand your audience, who wants to buy my products, who's engaging with my products in various online capacities. And now for one of the first times in marketing, you can take all of that hard work and you can point it at the television screen or you can point it at online video across the entire portfolio of incredible content like what's available through NBCU. And when you can do that holistically and bring those two worlds together, where as Krishan pointed out, NBCU has amazing data and understanding of their audiences. Brands have under, uh, an incredible, more in-depth understanding of their audiences. When you can bring those two things together, that's just an incredible opportunity to do some amazing marketing and, and also to continue to support the amazing content that's coming from, from NBCU. So I, th I think that's the a really central point to like where things are headed is bringing those two, those two worlds together. And the digitization of TV makes that possible against great content like SNL or, or This Is Us or whatever it is. Are we moving to a place where addressable and targeted advertising can really command the kind of premiums that have you know, that, that people have hoped for all these years that you can get so specific in terms of, you know, that 50% of your ad spend won't be wasted. Are you seeing when you do these larger campaigns and bring in all the data and all the tools that you have now at your disposal, are you seeing a commensurate increase in the kind of premiums that sponsors are paying for this placement or for these, these digital campaigns? Or are we starting to see digital dollars start to offset what has been lost as linear ratings just inevitably shrink at this period. Do you understand? I mean, are we talking about replacement dollars or are we seeing real premiums that are going to be really meaningful to an NBCU or a Disney, you know, or one of the larger media conglomerates in the coming years? Well, let, let me address the second part of your question first, because I think it's a very important one. The digitization of television content through this consumer shift to digital platforms is one that actually helps democratize access to content for consumers, but it also helps democratize access from marketers to those consumers. Um, in a broadcast unit model where everyone is seeing the same ad at the same time, the cost of entry for obvious reasons is very high because you're basically competing for marketers with marketers that are reaching consumers at scale. There's no way to break apart the unit, basically, right? Everyone right. watching along your feed at the same time. In digital, that's very different. It's an based um, value proposition, and therefore, through data and targeting, you can parse the impressions into different consumer segments that uh, appeal to different marketers. So, the democratization part is is the fact that way more marketers, we believe are now able to enter the premium video space in terms of getting their messages across to consumers. And so as a result, the utilization of that reach is far greater and therefore the value creation potential is much, much greater. And a partnership with the Trade Desk, for example, is actually one major avenue of how we bring net new marketers into the fold that the traditional television business may have not been able to reach just because its legacy infrastructure approach would have prevented that from happening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, Tim, were you going to say? You know, I was just going to build on that, which is that it, uh, it is providing this, this entry point to folks that, that maybe hadn't run or, or maybe hadn't participated in the upfront process before. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing because essentially what, what, what we're creating is a marketplace, right? We're, create, we're creating 
um, access to the full totality of what demand there is out there. So a, a marketer or a brand isn't limited by the fact that like, well, gosh, I've never participated in an upfront before. Like, can I still partner with NBCU? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> you do de definitely can. And so th those uh, doors are open to you now, which maybe hadn't been, you know, five or six years ago or, or, or longer. And, and I think that's a, a wonderful development because it creates a lot of ad diversity. It creates a lot of um, diversity of advertiser relationships with consumers and, and, and helps bring to the forefront, you know, things like, you know, direct to consumer brands and all this other stuff that maybe prior to, to this point in time hadn't really been able to leverage television as an effective uh, medium. And now it is available to them. And I think that's a great development. Yeah, no, we've seen a lot of coverage of how the uh, how just what you discussed has allowed brands like Warby, Par Warby Parker and Blue, like digital native brands have more access to old fashioned television advertising in this system. Let me ask you, um, how how custom can it get? How custom do advertise big marketers that want to do a cross platform deal? Like how narrowly defined do they want? women between a certain age that have just bought a car or how, how specific of the audience segments do you, are you asked to go after from, from marketers nowadays? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and it really depends on the marketer category uh, as well as the sophistication of those marketers in understanding their existing consumers and their, and their you know, consumer segments that they're trying to reach. What we've found actually is that most marketers um, that have built significant um, CRM systems and have a good understanding of their customers and potential customers are the ones that are creating more refined segmentation. And uh, in two thirds of the case for us running data enabled targeting campaigns, we actually custom match to marketers CRM systems in order to activate against those, those segments. So in some categories, I think it's broader, but in others where there's a steady data stream um, from their customer bases, whether you're talking about financial services or insurance or travel or e-commerce, um, you know, all the categories where you would assume that there's a uh, tight relationship between consumer uh, and, and marketer, um, the activation of custom segments is far greater than, than it has ever been. Are you finding any um, commonalities between the types of audience segments that marketers are interested? You know, I, I would imagine that there are still probably some sort of generally broad categories that, that are of interest, but, but then the ability to get that specific allows you to almost fine tune. Yeah, I mean, I, th I can take a, just yeah, go ahead, to add to there, Krishan, and then you can build, uh, add to it. But I, I think what's, unique about the, the point in time that we're in is that if you look at the you know vast majority of the history of television advertising, it's been centered around two vectors, basically, which is age and gender. And so now finally, we can do a little bit better than that, which is, which is really incredible because you have marketers, as Krishan pointed out, who have a really, really deep relationship with their customer and, and future customer and understand that at a much deeper level and they can start to segment that audience in a way that helps them have customized conversations with the consumer. And I think that's really, really powerful. And of course, there, there's other different brand categories that, that still rely on age and gender. It's a really effective way of marketing, but now we have the possibility to do quite a bit better. And so I think that just opens up so much for, for folks like us who, whose job it is to help them deploy that, that data across the media landscape. And, and it's also a great opportunity for, for NBCU uh, as well, because they can look at that same audience. And as Krishan pointed out, they're, they're helping to match those audiences with the NBCU um, uh, footprint. And I think those are just great avenues to do better marketing with customized messaging and all, all that kind of stuff. So it, it's really an exciting time. Do you find that each deal is its own unique animal? Are the metrics and the guarantees and the whatever, you know, whatever, whatever guarantees that are made as part of a larger deal, is it, um, Krishan, is it your experience that it's, that every deal kind of sets its own, has its own um, standards and, and metrics that are important? Or are you, again, are, is there, are you getting toward a certain uniformity within all of the diversity of of addressable and targeted advertising, if that makes any sense. 
No, I think, I think it's definitely the latter. And I think that's been the beauty of the, the television business in the past is that it has been relatively uniform, um, maybe in some ways to, to uh, you know, sort of limit the potential by only focusing on age and gender, as Tim was saying, but it, it has created a scalable business that both buyers and sellers of media, you know, could uh, transact on in a relatively transparent way in terms of measuring um, audiences and agreeing on currency. I think what we're seeing now is definitely a diversification of measurement approaches, um, KPIs, and even currencies. But I, I, I would say that falls way short of every deal or every campaign being its own, own thing. What we're finding is as we move to an impression-based model, the impressions and how they're measured need to be agreed to. Um, as you probably know, we rolled out a, a cross-platform measurement approach about um, three years now uh, called C-Flight that equivalized television-based impressions and digital impressions um, by focusing sort of on the key ingredients, um, completed views for a digital average minute audience for, for uh, linear, for example. Um, we didn't want to be conflated with um, digital ad views, you know, that are first frame, first pixel, or three seconds. So our entire currency framework in digital and CTV is based on a completed view metric where a, a consumer is watching the entire 15 or 30 second commercial in order for it to count for currency purposes. For marketers, we think we need to continue to set a very high standard there. Um, and then you layer on to that, once you've sort of agreed on the, on the base currency of impression measurement, you layer on to that um, additional factors, like in CTV, co-viewing now is a, you know, a significant um, unmeasured opportunity where, no surprise, just like in regular television viewing, you usually gather around the television set with multiple uh, people in your household, whether they're families uh, or friends, uh, and they're usually more than one person watching at any given point in time. Um, the same is the case for CTV, whether you're getting it through a traditional broadcast signal or you're getting it through an OTT device, co-viewing uh, still takes place, yet it is not fully captured yet by measurement companies that are focused on it. We're working on it, um, and the existing kind of measurement incumbents are working on it, but um, uh, when you add co-viewing factors to CTV, the audience expands even further than what is sort of commonly known. That's another one. Then you get to um, the ability to uh, measure impact uh, through attribution and ROI metrics, which uh, again, in a digitally measured world, you can because you're, you're able to um, run attribution pixels uh, uh, or focus on you know, ROI metrics that tie back an action that a consumer took after they've been exposed to, to, an, to an ad. So I do think that there's still standardization required on some of those more advanced measurement and attribution metrics. Uh, every time something new is possible, you know, there's a diverse, diversity of innovation and, and, and players uh, aim to fill that void. And I think that's actually a really good thing. And then over time, it usually consolidates into standards because the industry participants on both sides, you know, want, want to make it as efficient as possible as well. So I think that's where we are in the, in the journey of measurement and currency. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, would think, I think brands and marketers just, they, they want to be having a consistent conversation with, when they sit down with NBCU uh, every year. And then to the extent technology plays a role in the, in the execution of that later on, that has to be consistent as well so that they can do all, all, of, the, all of the things that Krishan mentioned. And so we are at this moment in time where we kind of have one foot in both worlds, where we have this tried and true world that's been measured on age and gender that everybody kind of agrees on over here. Mm -hmm. And then we're transitioning into this other thing where brands and marketers want to have this holistic conversation. It makes perfect sense, right? I mean, they want to be having a conversation with consumers where consumers are. And if those consumers are on linear, fantastic. If they're on connected television, fantastic. If they're on online, online video, great. But we're in this kind of one foot in both worlds right now where we're trying to standardize across that. So that conversation when brand XYZ sits down with NBCU for their you know, quarterly or annual conversation, they're all speaking the same language in both of those worlds because we have an established language over here and we just haven't quite gotten it there in the, in the connected side. But that's essentially what we're all spending our time thinking about is how do we create that holistic conversation because it all ultimately just makes perfect logical sense. If you look at it just through the lens of a brand or a marketer and the lens of the consumer, it makes so much sense. And then all of us in, in, in the middle of that transaction are just trying to make it as easy and seamless as possible. 
How much would you say that ROI and the, the definition of what the ROI metrics are going to be in a deal, how much of a focus is that in setting a large, you know, a, a multi-platform or even a, just a, a, a targeted advertising deal? I would imagine that there would be some natural tension there in terms of how do you define what did somebody click on the watching the extra long version? Did they click for more information? You know, did they go all the way into the car dealership and buy that car? Is it, how, how do you, how, how do you get your arms around what the deal making metrics will be in the area of ROI, which I know is hugely important to marketers, especially in the digital setting. Well, I, I, I think ultimately ROI does come down to the be all end metric of, you know, how is every media dollar spent helping you drive business in terms of revenue and profits. So there are various metrics in between that many digital platforms focus on. A lot of our conversations over the last couple of years with marketers and agencies, quite frankly, have focused on how do we uh, provide a metric that helps you determine the true impact of your business. And um, we launched uh, more broadly last week, something we call total investment impact, which basically measures your ability as a marketer um, that is partnering with NBC Universal across many different platforms as we're talking about from linear to digital, to, to CTV, to understand the total impact that investment had on your business. And so those are quite bespoke conversations at this point. They really take very sophisticated marketing and media investment teams on the client side uh, to be able to tie it back to um, revenue and profit metrics of those companies. We've been working in the auto category in particular, as you mentioned, Cynthia, is one that has, you know, very, very good sales data, obviously. And so any industry category, advertiser, where you have good sales data that can be tied back to media exposure lends itself for building out frameworks like this. We've built an entire team around this that actually came from um, a Comcast marketing team. So they were media analysts that sat on the marketing side of the Comcast house, assessing and understanding and optimizing and refining Comcast's media spend in order to acquire and retain and grow their subscriber base, and we've now turned that team basically into a client-facing team that sits with our marketers um, and scientifically parses through how we measure every exposure um, and every dollar spent with NBC Universal back to a sales impact, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of car sales in, in this case, for example. So um, that's really bleeding edge kind of innovation, I would say. There is no one mousetrap that, um, mm -hmm. For, for everyone, but we're investing an enormous amount of resources and talent in our data science teams and our, you know, our client partnership teams, quite frankly, to be able to, uh, to pull that off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's, that's central to, to how I, I think programmatic play, plays a role in this too, is helping to enable everything that Krishan just said. Like if you, if you look at it from a, um, like, hey, I need to make my investment count or the age old question, like, did it work? <laughs> right. And like, how, how do we help people gain the insights into understanding where their marketing dollar is coming down to, to sales or whatever it is, whatever action it is that they're trying to drive could be a sign up for something could be, it could be an in sale, whatever, whatever it is. Like we, we look at things in, in, you know, kind of a relatively straightforward way, which is that customers bring data into the platform. They help use that data to plan and understand the right ways to invest that dollar. Then, pushing that through to execution. And then with insights, they can understand the, that question, which is, did it work? And then where you're finding areas of, of, of really good return on that media investment, you continue to reinvest. And that's a really virtuous cycle of how people can start to think about the, the media business um, because we have so many more inputs now that we haven't had before, especially in the, in the TV investment around uh, all the things that you mentioned before, Cynthia, which is like, did someone ultimately go convert? Did someone mm -hmm. engage with, with that ad in some way, shape or form? Like all, all of these metrics are, are there now. And so it's about how we understand those insights so that we can continue to reinvest in, in the things that are, that are providing good value. And then when you marry that with, you know, the, the content quality uh, out there in the, in the premium ecosystem, it, it's a really, really virtuous cycle for marketers. And so uh, it, it's, uh, it's all possible now. I think it's just agreeing on some of the standardization and, and some of the things we have to do uh, over the next couple of years, but all of that at a base level can, can happen now. Mm -hmm. I know this is, a, this, is, this is my last question for you. Our time has come to an end here, but I, I, I'm curious, 
it sounds to me like the, the technology and the science behind marketing and advertising is growing by leaps and bounds. Do you feel like the storytelling, the creative aspect of advertising has kept up? It, the, you know, we're, we've heard for, for some years now that, that the, the traditional notion of the 30 second spot really needs to be reinvented. Can, do either of you have examples where you see a few people are really on the cutting edge creatively of using the tools and the new pathways to get impressions in front of consumers? I think it's a great question. Um, and again, it's one that our teams are partnering with many marketers and agencies on because it's always been the, the ingredient um, that ultimately can make a huge difference in terms of how a marketing message resonates. So one of the first things one can do is actually be able to track the impact of different creatives um, for any given advertiser, uh, you know, down to KPIs that matter. Um, and then it's offering marketers a suite of services that allows you to actually understand how creative messaging differences may impact the overall marketing impact. I will say that on a product like Peacock, for example, um, where we've launched with you know, a significantly reduced ad load versus linear, but even any other digital platform for that matter, um, we run no more than five minutes per hour um, and no more than two ads uh, per pod. It actually allows you to measure the efficacy in a significantly more effective way than if you have a string of 10 or 12 ads running in a linear pod. So the partnerships with our launch sponsor sponsors, we have 10 launch sponsors that have been with us uh, since we launched within the Comcast footprint uh, in April and, uh, and, and nationally in July, those partnerships are yielding, I would say, the beginnings, Cynthia, of um, how we can partner with marketers on the creative messaging side in addition to the media, media signs. There's a lot of work to be done there, but, but it requires a depth of partnership and experimentation that requires resources and time, quite frankly. But, but I'm optimistic that the canvas of sort of digital and OTT and CTV and um, kind of a restart on the consumer experience and the advertising experience uh, will make a huge difference. I'll give one example. We launched, um, we have sort of a roadmap of ad product innovations that we're rolling out on Peacock over the next uh, 12 to 18 months with these launch sponsors. Um, one of the first ones uh, we launched was Podcasts, um, voice activated remote control to be able to feature what we call on command ads where marketers can um, prompt a user to speak into their Xfinity remote um, and then prompt an action that could unlock a promotion or some other sort of um, feature that the advertiser wants to, wants to unlock. We had two of our launch sponsors, um, Unilever and Target actually collaborate on the creative campaigns that features Unilever products, but you, you know, in target retail environments through a promotion, that's a completely new creative basically that we're creating at the intersection of our content offering within Peacock, our advertising expertise uh, within our team and two major marketers. Uh, and I think those are the types of things that I think will really make a difference. Yeah, I mean, creativity is the, the engine uh, of the television business, right? It, it is the engine behind content and it's the engine behind advertising. You know, there's a kind of an old joke that like nobody ever cried at a display ad, right? Um, but uh, television creates this opportunity for creativity that doesn't exist in any other medium, which is that you can leverage the, the proverbial sight, sound and motion to really connect with the consumer. And that's now even more possible with customizations and all the data and everything we've been talking about for the last half hour to leverage all of that information to, to introduce that into how you think about creative um, is, is just so, so uh, uh, important right now because you can do that and you can have this customized conversation with, uh, with the consumer. And, and creativity will continue to be that engine for, for both how advertising gets delivered and ultimately how the content's created as well. So it's a, it's a just perfect storm of opportunity. Well, thank you. That's a perfect place to end it on. Thank you so much for ta uh, talking to us and, and being with us to talk about the, you know, the art and the state of, of advertising in the digital landscape. We so appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you.
My pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety, and I want to welcome you to this keynote conversation with Dulé Hill and James Roday Rodriguez, stars and executive producers of Psych 2, Lassie Come Home. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, Psych debuted uh, all the way back in 2006, went on to air eight seasons, spawned a musical episode and two new films, including Psych 2, Lassie Come Home, which uh, premiered on the Peacock streaming service in July. But I actually want to go back to the beginning. Um, when you first started this show, did you ever imagine it would have such a lengthy run and, and you'd be living with these characters for 14 years? Is that strange to think about? Uh, I figured the pilot wouldn't get picked up and I'd be back in New York doing theater. Uh, but it was a, it was a quick job uh, and I would get paid for it. And then, um, you know, because up until that point, I was essentially the kiss of death to anything that I got cast in. I just assumed it would be another chapter in what was becoming a growingly uh, inauspicious career. Uh, but then the magic ingredient showed up and it was uh, Dulé Hill. Looking a lot like he looks right now uh, for the tighter fade. The tighter fade, maybe it may be a, a little less beard and a little less gray. <laughs> <laughs> but I, for myself, I mean, I, I thought that if the network gave us a chance to find our footing, that we could have a, a nice run. I thought that there was something, something special and unique there. I thought Steve Franks really had, a, had formulated a nice dynamic on the paper. And if we'd given a chance to, to at least find our stride, that we, we would be able to do something. I did not, I did not foresee the, the length that we have now. Though. I did not see eight seasons and two psych movies and counting. That was so far off of my thought of what the show could, could do. I'd come from a show that had a, a long running, a, a long, you know, seven seasons. So I knew that shows could do it, but I definitely did not see this coming. Uh, James, were you sort of a show killer? I, I wasn't aware that you had had um, series that didn't go as long before. Were they pilots or were they actual series? No, they actually went to series and uh, that's precisely why you weren't aware of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think the longest one, I, I believe, I was on a show called Mismatch and I think that might have gone one full season. Uh, yeah. Nobody talked, but it was, I do think it made it one full season. No, 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 you're selling yourself way too short, Road Days. I saw it. That's true. I, and, yes, that was, that was the work that Dulé was familiar with. Uh, yes, when he and signed I saw the hair. Shows. I saw the yeah. hair. Yes, um, but there were a couple shows before that that I think got yanked after two and th three episodes, respectively. So uh, yeah, it wasn't a great it wasn't a great run, and uh, honestly, like I, I sort of felt like you know it doesn't have to be for everyone. You know, doing TV, maybe I should I need to go back to New York. I belong. I belong you know, on the stage doing theater. That's a noble, you know, profession. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's old school and that's good. You can convince yourself that, you know, it's going to be good. And then, uh, and then it's like changed all of that. Wow. And the show hinges so much on the chemistry between you two. It's so much fun to see you work together. I'm curious, do you first remember meeting each other? I mean, were you like, that's the guy from Mismatch? Were you excited? <laughs> here, here, here's the funny thing. I didn't realize that Roday was the guy from Mismatch until we showed up to do the pilot. And inside the production office, they had all of our headshots on the wall. And it's when I saw the headshot on the wall that I said, wait a second. Because the way his hair was in that headshot, I said, this is the dude from Mismatch who had that terrible, that terrible ass hair dude. This is exactly who this dude is. But uh, you know I mean, uh, I do remember meeting Roday the first time. It was, I was having a chemistry read with him. Because I'd met with Steve Franks, Chris Henze, and Kelly Kolchett. Uh, initially, we talked about the role, and then the next the next meeting was having a chemistry read with Roday, who was already cast as Sean. And I vividly remember being completely shocked and thrown off course because he wasn't staying on dialogue. <laughs> he was he was riffing and improvising, and he was doing really great at it. But I'm coming from the world of Aaron Sorkin, so it was no what is written is what you say. So I'm sorry. At first, I'm like, brother, are you trying to are you trying to sabotage my meeting right here? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> like what's happening here? And then, uh, and then the second time I met him was when he came up. He came up to uh, my house because I was getting ready to test for the role. 
And that's when I think we really started to connect right there and started to, I guess, find our groove. Yeah, I, I had sort of improvised with everybody through that process. Um, so it was just sort of like, it was second nature for me at that point because I had read with so many different versions of Gus um, that I was, you know, I was getting bored, frankly. And so I was, <laughs> I was just changing it up and, and then it became like an interesting exercise and like, you know, who was sort of open to working that way and, and who wasn't. And it was kind of a fun litmus test to see how loose, how loosey goosey uh, this connection could be. And so you didn't get anything different and you didn't get anything special. Everybody got, everybody got the looseness. <laughs> I was shook. I was like, what is this dude doing? I said, oh, wait till I see this dude out there in the parking lot. <laughs> Uh, but the good news is everybody wanted uh, this for Dulé. We were all sort of uh, collectively on board the idea of of what he could bring to Gus and how it was so very different than than what was on the page. And frankly, I think what was in Steve Franks's brain and had been in his brain from the from the the time that he started working on Psych, it was very exciting that uh, everyone was sort of willing to pivot and and change course and. I, I personally had not been exposed uh, to that type of groupthink before. So I found it incredibly refreshing that uh, Steve was so open and that when the opportunity presented itself and Dulé was available, everybody was like, well, yeah, obviously we'll do this. Uh, and we did, and that was very exciting. Um, I wanna talk about how not only these characters evolved over the years, but how you as, as people have. Um, you're both producers on the show. James, you've actually went on to write and, and direct episodes, all while being the lead actors as well. Um, what sort of prompted you both to get more involved behind the scenes, or was that something you had always hoped for from the start? You know, part of it at the beginning was was because we just needed to. Uh, you know, the, the show shot in Vancouver in a, in a bit of a bubble. Um, Steve and the writers were all in Los Angeles. Uh, USA was a fledgling network at the time. They hadn't yet cemented themselves as like the blue sky uh, juggernaut that they became. And, and we didn't quite know what the show was. Um, we knew what the premise was. Uh, we sort of had ideas of where it could go and what we wanted it to be. But, but we, you know, we hadn't found our sea legs. And Dulé and I were the two guys that were there every day, all day long. So it just, it kind of became uh, necessary that we uh, that we take on some extra responsibility and help guide the ship, and then once we found our groove, uh, it was great because everybody got to participate in the success. I mean, is that a normal part of the creative? Did you enjoy being part of the creative process? Is it, or do you sometimes just like being, you know, an actor for hire? I imagine it changes with every job. I think it changes yeah. with every job. In terms of being on site, it was a uh, it was refreshing and it was fun. I mean, well, Day and I we really had a nice synergy we worked well together and being and I guess getting coming to set and figuring out how to make this thing better each time was uh it was a nice exercise to do for for eight seasons and I think this uh that's tools that you take with you into into other projects but there is also sometimes where it's nice where you are coming in to do the work and somebody else is is is, is dealing with all of those I guess those headaches now, how did bringing these characters back for Psych 2 sort of sort of happen? I feel like after you ended the series, there was always talk of doing a movie, and then the first movie was so successful. I'm sort of curious if it's it was a matter of you were all like, we're there as soon as you can make it happen. And James, as a co-writer on the film, you know, how did you sort of uh, decide what the story would be? Well, you know, interestingly enough, uh, one of the first uh, approaches to making uh, something beyond the series was to do uh, two movies and shoot them back to back uh, because, you know, you can save a lot of money that way. And then, you know, the studio ends up with two movies and they can drop them whenever they want. Um, and, when, and when we thought that that might be what we were doing, we, we broke two stories. So we had two movies in our heads. And then when we, uh, when we ultimately decided to just shoot the first Psych movie, we kind of put the other story on the back burner knowing that, hey, we can always do that one. And then uh, a, a stroke of incredibly bad luck hit, hit us and our cast when, uh, 
when our dear brother and family member Tim Amundsen suffered a, a major stroke. So the first movie became kind of a, we have to do this. We have to do this for, for Tim. Uh, he couldn't be in the movie, uh, the body of the film while we were shooting it. Uh, we had to rewrite the script uh, last sort of 11th hour. He was able to appear on like a, on one side of a, of a phone call. Um, but it, it felt uh, like there was a, a glaring uh, hole. There was a big hole for all of us when we made that first movie. And we knew uh, that we would have to make at least one more um, because if Tim was gonna battle through this and get back up on the horse, we wanted to be the ones that were there supporting him. So we took the story that we had always planned on doing, uh, ironically, with Lassiter sort of front and center uh, and didn't actually have to change it that much because we had always planned on doing a sort of rear window homage, uh, you know, with Lassiter front and center in a, in a hospital or like with a broken leg or something solving a murder. And we still made that movie. We just did it uh, using, you know, his real life experience uh, odd and, and ironic that, that, that those two sort of lined up the way that they did. Uh, so we ended up making uh, a movie that we had always intended to make with Lassiter um, in the same position that we had planned on him being in uh, and Tim fighting back from suffering a major stroke. It was pretty, it was pretty crazy. You know, I think really it's a, it's a testament to how committed to the process Tim Amundsen is, you know what I mean? How committed to the storyline that he is. I mean, he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to go and have a stroke and I'm going to, you know, put myself in the situation so that when I be going to do this film, I'll be ready to do it. And he, he just, that's just, that's just Tim Amundsen for you. So, I mean, he's, he's my hero. He really is. That is method. That's method. You know what I mean? Method. <laughs> I, Amundsen. You don't get any better than that. <laughs> I am such a fan of his. And so it, it was it, the way that you worked it into the storyline. I know necessity is the mother of all invention, but it really felt organic and, and, and was so terrific um, um, to see him. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a phenomenal artist and a phenomenal human being and really has so much power, strength, and uh, fortitude to be able to come up against this, this, this obstacle, this uh, unexpected circumstance in life. And he really has pressed through and, sh and sh I guess, keeps sh sh shined even brighter and through the process. So I'm really, uh, he really, like I said, I was joking with in that before when I said he's my hero, but he really is one of my heroes. I he's agree. Yeah. I, it's it's amazing. He just, he never ceases to amaze me. And, and every time uh, a hurdle is put in front of him, uh, he leaps it. It's crazy. Uh, every step along the way, he's exceeded every expectation. And I personally was worried that his chest hair would stop growing as a result mm -hmm. uh, of what he went through. And the good news <laughs> is it has not. No. No. And um, I believe I heard Steve Frank say that he wanted to make five more movies. I, I don't know if he was kidding. I mean, it seems like a very arbitrary number, but are, are you guys up to continue these characters as long as he wants to? I don't think he was kidding. I think Steve would make 25 more movies. Uh, I think he would make Psych Forever. Uh, that's who he is. He's, he's the tallest version of Peter Pan that you'll ever meet. And I think Psych is, is him and he is Psych. Um, and I think as long as there's an appetite and our fans remain as devoted to us uh, as they always have been, uh, I think we, we feel both an obligation and of a desire to give back because we couldn't have done this without uh, Steve, obviously, and we couldn't have done it without the psychos. So it puts us in a pretty easy position to say yes. Dulé, you up for more? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Rodé pretty much just said everything that I would say right there, where as long as the fans have a desire for it, as long as there's still an appetite for it, we, we love the characters, we love getting together, we love the cycles, we love engaging with the cycles when the movies come out and checking back in with everybody. So as long as there was a, a deep desire to have more, and everybody was on board, we would do it. You guys actually give them a great little nod at the start of this movie where you're like, our fans, you know, there are certain things they expect of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what has the fan response been to this movie? They've loved it. I mean, I, it always blows me away how, how, I mean, the show premiered in 2006 and we're now in 2020. And the fact that there's that much engagement all of these years later, and the excitement for even the movie coming out. And once the movie came out, the excitement that is there and the, I guess how it brings people together just to, just to engage in psych, it always blows me, blows me away. They've, uh, they've 
been the best group of fans that I could ever have asked for, that we could have, have ever asked for. And I look forward to seeing where the journey's going to go. Yeah, we're like an old board game that they, they keeps getting passed down from like siblings to younger siblings and from parents to children. And even though there's like bigger, shinier new toys out there, you know, it's like operation or monopoly. Like there's always going to be a place for it and, and nostalgia. And, and we realize that we are now part of, of younger people's nostalgia, which doesn't make a ton of sense because we're older than them. But uh, it's, it's been a very unique ride. And the way the fan base has grown has also has been unexpected, to say the least. Um, it's it's a, something of a phenomenon. And we're very lucky to be to be a part of it, for sure. You know, the show was such a staple on the USA Network for, for so many years. Um, but Psych 2, Lassie Come Home, made the jump to a brand new streaming platform, Peacock. Um, sort of curious how you felt about that. And with so many different platforms and, you know, ways to watch and consume uh, shows like this. Um, you know, does that excite you that, that, that there are all these places where you can continue to do this work? I mean, my biggest concern was making sure that the Psychos found the movie. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they had waited for it for a while and especially, you know, getting the, the Lasseter that they, that they love so much. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that we figured out a way where as many people, uh, many of our fans could see it as possible. Um, and that was, to me, that was really the only challenge um, because it is the future. It does seem to be where we're heading. You're gonna have to have a bunch of apps and subscriptions if you wanna see all the stuff that you love. Peacock, you know, welcome to the club. Uh, but, you know, I, I think they're still working out deals with aggregates and who carries Peacock and who doesn't have Peacock and, you know, what box you can get it on and what you can't. And so uh, I just, for me, I just wanted to all get, you know, sort of streamlined so that uh, people who want to see the movie can see the movie. Um, so for me, it's less about, oh my gosh, there's, there's so many platforms and more about like make it easy for people to, to get it <laughs> so that, you know, it's not a like, oh gosh, I roll headache. I gotta go find some new thing. Uh, just make it as user friendly as possible. As for the, as for all the options out there, it's, I don't know, Dulé, uh, I would love to hear what you think of this too, but it feels like a, it's a very bizarre paradox because it seems like there should be more work than ever, more opportunities than ever, um, more people creating content than ever. It doesn't necessarily feel like it's gotten any easier uh, you know, to move the ball down the field or to get a job. That's what's very strange to me about, about this whole movement of like more product than ever, more content than ever, more people making it than ever. And yet it still feels like you got to hustle more than ever. Yeah, I mean, I definitely would agree with that. I don't see, I, I, when I look at and see the, I guess the different platforms that are coming out, I think it's a wonderful thing that there's all these different avenues, at least in theory, to either be a part of content that is already being produced or to even get content produced yourself. But uh, I have not seen it necessarily roll out that way in, in terms of real action. Uh, I don't know. I mean, and maybe, maybe there's just more, maybe because there's more opportunity, there's more like more actors coming to the, the table. Maybe, I mean, maybe that could be maybe compared to say 20 years ago, there's not as there's more actors in, who are in the industry but I have not necessarily seen it where it's just so much work because there's so much opportunity out there that you have to resist. You have to kind of weed through all the different options. That's like, oh my gosh, I have a headache. Please, please, no more offers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, uh, and in, you know, in terms of Psych being a part of the Peacock launch, what, one thing that I am, you know, proud of and happy about was like Psych was a part of USA building that brand. Mm -hmm. They were an integral part of, of building that brand and to be able to, it's like to still be around, to be a part of a, a, the new incarnation for NBC Universal, in, Universal to be a, one of the pillars of the Peacock now, building out of the Peacock. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I think it's, a, I appreciate how they allowed for the fan base to find the product without having to pony up money for the product. I think that that it would have been a little harder for me if it was okay. We're going to put it on the platform, but everyone has to pay to see it. It's like, well, that's not that's not the psychos, <laughs> you know. I mean, there are psychos who will now once they're there will will pay to go back and watch the series and be you know go into the the peacock world. But this is a, a more of a a love fest thing. So I do appreciate how they 
offered it up on the free tier. Mm -hmm. No, I have to, I have to say talking about all the various streaming platforms and this was the easiest I've ever had signing up for something. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like, Oh, that's it. So, (laughs) right. Um, you know, you talk about the lack of work sometimes, and obviously we're in this very strange period where with a pandemic, there's not as much production going on as, you know, we would like. Um, I'm sort of curious, are, are you working now through the COVID-19 epidemic? Um, what do you need in order to feel safe to go to sets? Um, you know, what are, what are sort of your ideal situations for moving forward? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm in production on the third season of uh, A Million Little Things, and uh, we started uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, it's been it's it's been very well thought out and regimented and laid out for us. There are protocols that are very easy to follow, and like anything, once once they become routine, it starts to feel less alien and more like a new normal. So as far as safety goes, I would say we, we feel pretty safe. We're up in Vancouver, so I feel like we already have some separation just because we went from a place, you know, where you're being bombarded by bad statistics that look bad, that sound bad um, every day. Sometimes they're dipping, sometimes they're getting worse. It's always in the thousands to a place that is essentially... Uh, you know, flatten their curve. And, you know, th- there are rarely new cases. There there have been almost no deaths. And so you cross the border and already you just feel like, oh, this is going to be better. This is going to be easier. And then on top of that, with the protocols, it seems like they're taking it even more seriously, even though they've kind of gotten ahead of it, you know, than we were when we had it. <laughs> uh, so it makes sense. Like the equation goes, oh, well, this is why they're doing better because this is their way of life. And everybody sort of collectively said, let's, let's do this the right way and, and look, look what happened. So I feel good. Our cast feels good. Our crew feels good. Uh, like anything else, I think, you know, the only way that this is going to go sideways is if, if, is if people stop caring about one another and and start doing stupid things uh, outside of the workplace because frankly there's just there's no way to sort of do that at the workplace it's uh, it's bubbled up uh, everybody's masked the you know everything is being cleaned constantly we're testing twice a week some shows are doing more than that um, it's you know it's going to be the responsibility that you carry when you leave uh, set. And, and, and knowing that it's the same thing, you know, just because uh, you punch out, you still have to, you just care, just care, just care about your fellow man and woman. And, uh, and that's how we're going to beat this thing. And that's, that's what I'm seeing up here in Vancouver. So I got to say, it feels relatively sustainable at this point. And I count myself very lucky uh, to have a job and to be doing it up here. Yeah. For, for myself, I mean, I, uh... I actually backed out of a project that I was on before. It was filming on location and it seemed to be going back too fast for me. I just wasn't, I, just, I, I get the rush to go back to work. I get we all need to go back to work, but it seemed like it was doing too much too quickly. And then now, I mean, my first time on, on set is going to be coming up when we do this West Wing reunion. And I do feel, I do, at least with the protocols that I've, that I've heard of so far, like we had, a, I guess the, that, informative meeting, it seems, it at least allows me to, I guess, quell some of my concerns because I feel like, okay, there's enough steps being taken. The, the thing that really, for me, that, that is the most challenging though, is the on-location filming because, mm-hmm. I, you know, I have a wife, I have a 16-year-old daughter and I have a one-year-old son. Like, you know, for example, my wife is on a show and they want, they're going to want her to quarantine for a couple of weeks before she starts to work and then out, be out there for the entire length of the run. That just, <laughs> that can't happen when you have, <laughs> when you have a 16 year old daughter, you know, and, and we are here. So really my hope and desire is that more work can come back to Los Angeles. They can do, that the city of Los Angeles will do more to, our state of California will do more to, to bring work back to LA so that families can be together. Because it really is a challenging thing to say, okay, well, okay, I'm, I'm leaving in September and I'll see you in February. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? <laughs> it's, it's, and, you, and there's no, you don't want us coming back and forth. Because before, like last year, I was in Toronto filming and I would fly back and forth. She was in Atlanta, fly back and forth, and we just would make it work. But if it's going to be a type of thing where people need to be, kind of stay in certain places, 
that gets real tricky for families. So that's the focus that I would like to see the industry now start to look at, say, what can we do? How can we make this? And I know we're just starting, they're just starting to ramp back up now, but I hope that that is the next thing that they focus on is how do we still nurture families? Because people cannot just necessarily get up and be gone for nine or 10 months out the year when they have, you know, a, a 15 year old, 16 year old child at home who also has their needs also. I didn't realize that the West Ring reunion was going to be, I, I thought it was going to be done over Zoom. You're actually doing it in person. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, we're, doing a, we're doing it in person. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. Um, before we go, I'm curious, uh, you know, Sean and Gus have been through so much over the years. Um, is there any kind of dream storyline you would like to see in one of these upcoming hmm. five movies? Wow. And coming storyline. I think the the nov to me the novelty and and I'm this is actually recently uh, informed by me binging the first season of Cobra Kai, which it took me way too long to do because uh, Ralph and Billy are both alumni of the show and they're both wonderful gentlemen and we know them both and obviously we love the Karate Kid. It's part of our childhood, so it took me way too long to get to it, but. Watching it, I was like, wow, what a, this is such a novelty. Like these two guys created these iconic figures that everyone can identify and think and thinks of when you say Karate Kid, you know, you think of Daniel and Cobra Kai and the whole thing. And we're getting to watch them step back into those skins, what, 35 years later, what a rare and unusual uh, opportunity. And I think they're pulling it off like beautifully, like what a neat trick, like, that show just goes down like Kool-Aid for me. Um, and to a lesser extent, we're doing the same thing. Like, so, I, so for me, it's less about individual storylines and just about like the novelty of seeing us be 20-somethings and then 30-somethings and now 40-somethings playing the same characters. Uh, it just hasn't happened that often. Mm -hmm. So... I just think it's exciting to watch to watch these characters grow over decades. You know, that's not a movie where, you know, you're, you're using prosthetics or visual effects to make people look younger and older. It's actually in real time. Um, so I think the most exciting element about psych moving forward and doing more movies is just the evolution of characters that were born in 2006. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's the, that, that's the answer right there. You can't, you can't really add to that. I mean, having the characters evolve over the years and seeing how their life evolves, how it all, all is happening in real time. When Sean and Gus first got together, I mean, <laughs> Gus wasn't, Gus wasn't, uh, wasn't having a, having a baby on the way, married and having a, or engaged and having a baby on the way. Sean wasn't, wasn't married and Sean wasn't dating Juliet. Actually, they didn't even know Juliet even existed. And I think, I think as the series is going on or the show is going on, the, the storyline is going on, seeing how they focus, how their life evolves and how they even peering into the life of the life of Lassie, the life, the life of Juliet, the life of Selene and seeing how things evolve for them on, along this, this journey that they're on, I think would be interesting to see. Because I mean, again, like, it's like we're in there, as what they were saying, we're in, we're in our forties now, at least the, the characters are in there. I mean, I'm not in my forties. I mean, I'm, I'm 25. I don't know what he's talking about, but the characters are in the forties, you know, <laughs> And I think seeing seeing how life progresses for them over time is a, has been fun to play, and I think it'll be interesting to still to see where it goes as life as the I guess as the series I say the series as the storyline goes on. And this is also the first time that we we've potentially had Sean and Gus in stable relationships at the same time that have the potential to go the distance. So it's also the first time we've seen two uh, strong women characters that are going to be a part of this uh, universe now. Um, and how they get along with one another and uh, what that, you know, what that team up could potentially look like uh, as well, since neither of them are going anywhere and Sean and Gus are never going to stop being Sean and Gus. I think that's right. that adds a whole new uh, flavor <laughs> to it that we, that we haven't had on our show before. Well, I look forward to 50 years from now when they're in an old folks home <laughs> together, 
making everyone crazy. <laughs> um, I, I honestly, um, I hope you guys, guys just keep doing these. It's, it's so fun to revisit them. Uh, I want to remind everyone watching at home that Psych 2, Lassie Come Home, uh, is now available for streaming on Peacock. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Our pleasure. Our pleasure.